When the ethereals marched on the celestial plains, they were met with the final alliance of the living and the dead. The remaining mortals hoped the spirits of the once living to be the blade to reach the hearts of the gods, but alas, their dreams crashed against the insurmountable shores that are the ethereals. Once again, every attack was destroyed, and to their horror, they found that the power of the gods could destroy even the long dead. And by the end of the war, the celestial plains had grown silent, and not a soul was left to wander its imponderable fields. Before leaving to face the demons in their own domain, Emok had erected a great door to seal away the opening to their world, and it closed behind him to assure that no longer would the demons interfere with the plans of the ethereals. Upon his return, it is said that Emok was unrecognizable. His body had wilted and shriveled, looking old haggard and worn. His cheeks sunk deep into his face, and his eyes had lost their once incandescent luster. Many believed upon his return that he was dying, and given his interminable slumber, their suspicions appeared confirmed. After his return, the doors were left open long enough to allow a parcel of demons through who would form armies under the ethereals in an effort to help them maintain control over the world and create an information network and potentially uncover any plans to overthrow the rule of the gods. After this, the doors were permanently sealed with an even greater seal placed over them. With this, it seemed that the rule of the ethereals was unremitting. However, it would seem that nothing could satisfy their paranoia. As their power grew, so did the lengths at which they would go to keep it. They began rounding up all practitioners of magic and slaughtering them wholesale, a mass genocide in the hopes that by wiping away all knowledge of how the ethereals came into the world, so too would disappear the hope of discovering a method of banishment. To this purpose, they not only killed all practitioners of magic, but gathered all knowledge of magic and the like and destroyed it as well, leaving the denizens of the world ignorant and helpless without the guidance of their new masters. And it would only be a few generations before all sparks of hope for a change or memories of freedom would be lost. However, the elves had other plans. Before being slain, the few left that knew magic began a process of infusing the knowledge into the very lifeblood of their species, so that even without proper training and guidance, the use of mana through magic would be as instinctual to them as breathing was to every other race. During Emok's long slumber, it appeared the world settled into the submission it would forever take. However, an agent was working against him even in these times. An inconspicuous figure, adorned in rags, wielding nothing but a cane he used to help himself walk. He found himself among the many populaces, and began whispering of a guarantee to be able to strike the bodies of the ethereals themselves. A Drostian, a practically mythical figure of impossible knowledge and power that would forever change the world, remembered as the first wizard and father of magic. It would seem impossible that knowledge of this man and his plans would never have reached the ears of the ethereals, either from obedient slaves or from the demonic agents who patrolled the hordes of their chattel, and yet it never did. If word was known, the demons must have believed this may be their only chance to overthrow their new masters. And so Adrostian began slowly reintroducing magic in a more disciplined, controlled manner than before. As well as this, it would appear that he and his comrades came to better understand Emok's avatar as word got out of life, returning to his once ravaged body. It would seem that under great effort and duress, his avatar breaks down, that the weight of wielding his incomprehensible power was too much, and afterwards he would remain comatose as his body recovers. This was not the first time that he had disappeared, but it was the longest. As the Drostian finished preparations, he knew that Emok would be awakening soon. He would have to find a way to force the god of gods to overexert himself once more, and given his tendency to personally see the defeat of so many of his foes, it was predictable that in the face of disrespect, Emok would deal punishment again himself. So it was decided that the giants, mightiest of the mortals, would begin a rebellion in an effort to play on the hubris of the god, and so they did. As expected, Emok did not appreciate the affront to his rule, and even though he had just returned to consciousness, he once again set out to personally deliver divine punishment. Emok met the giants alone and eradicated them, nearly to extinction. At the climax of the battle, the once proud king of the giants met Emok on the battlefield. But Emok wanted the memory of this farce to live on, so he spared the king, only taking from him his arm and eye and leaving him scarred. Emok returned to his throne to recover, and Adrostian gathered his many forces. 
forming an army headed by his council of disciples, and with a strange new device, he declared war against the Ethereals.